Okay, this is the third part of 8-1. So now we're moving down uh, inferior in the abdominal wall, and we're going to look at the structures of the inguinal canal, which are identical to or derived from the structures of the abdominal wall. Uh, so here in this uh, drawing, you can actually see all of those same structures we just talked about in the previous lecture about the abdominal wall. What's interesting is that the uh, gonads develop retroperitoneally, which means they develop in the back of the abdominal cavi uh, cavity. A structure called the gubernaculum then draws the testes down in the male into the scrotum. So the testes are developing between the peritoneum and the transversalis fascia, getting drawn down. Part of that peritoneum gets drawn down with the testicles and forms a sac around the testicles. Uh, so this sac uh, is formed from two different layers of the peritoneum. Those layers are called the tunica vaginalis, uh, uh, parietal and visceral layers of the tunica vaginalis. Uh, so the uh, scrotum itself and the spermatic cord contains the rest of these, uh, all of these structures, including the peritoneum, except for one, transversus abdominis muscle. Because transversus abdominis muscle is horizontally oriented and located above the spermatic cord, uh, above the inguinal canal, then that structure does not get drawn down into the spermatic cord, into the scrotum. So first we'll be talking a lot about the male anatomy because it's uh, much more complex and, and interesting. Uh, so uh, from, then we'll talk about the female anatomy in a short while. So uh, here we can see all of the different structures that make up the spermatic cord in the male. So first, of course, you have the uh, external spermatic fascia, which is derived from the external abdominal oblique muscle. Deep to that, you have the, um, the aponeurosis of the internal abdominal oblique gets pulled down as the next layer of the spermatic cord. This layer of the spermatic cord, the layer from the internal abdominal oblique, uh, actually develops some muscle fiber in it uh, because it's derived from the internal abdominal oblique muscle. These muscle fibers uh, in this layer are, are called the cremaster muscle, and they're important in the male anatomy to raise and lower the testicle. This happens in a number of instances. One is to regulate temperature because the uh, development of the spermatozoa uh, in the testicles uh, is critically uh, controlled by temperature. Another instance is a, a reflex in order to protect the testicles. Uh, so moving deep uh, to that uh, cremaster muscle, we have the internal spermatic fascia uh, labeled here, which is opened uh, below this point, uh, which allows you to see uh, the contents inside the internal spermatic fascia and inside the spermatic cord as a whole. So that internal spermatic fascia derived from transversalis fascia. Now within that spermatic cord, we see a number of contents, the ductus deferens, uh, through which the sperm travel uh, along their path from the epididymis. Uh, we also see the testicular artery, uh, as well as the pampiniform plexus of veins. And finally, we see the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. That uh, genital branch of genitofemoral nerve innervates uh, cremaster muscle causes it to contract. <clears throat> and then of course we have the tunica vaginalis we can see here with, with its two layers covering the uh, epididymis and uh, the testicle. So uh, let's take a look at the external anatomy of the inguinal canal. We can see the inguinal com canal is composed from an imperfection or an opening between layers of fascia. Uh, so there are two openings that form the inguinal canal. There is a superficial inguinal ring and a deep inguinal ring. The superficial inguinal ring is caused by an opening in that uh, aponeurosis of the external abdominal oblique, which is the most superficial uh, of the muscular layers. The deep inguinal ring opens up into the peritoneal cavity. Uh, so uh, it is uh, uh, the uh, entry point, the opening through that transversalis fascia. 
if we open up the inguinal canal by excising uh, and cutting through the external abdominal oblique and the internal abdominal oblique muscles, then we can see the spermatic cord uh, encased by the external spermatic fascia. We can, so we've opened up the, uh, the uh, superficial inguinal ring, but we can still, now we can see the location of the deep inguinal ring, this uh, teal circle. <clears throat> so the inguinal canal has an anterior and a posterior wall. The posterior wall is composed of that transverse salus fascia through which the deep inguinal ring uh, forms and the spermatic cord uh, travels. Now there's a small region just behind the superficial inguinal ring and that's called Hesselbach's triangle. Hesselbach's triangle uh, is a uh, basically just a region of that transversalis fascia and it has clinical implications because it's particularly weak and allows for herniation of structures through it with an increase of abdominal pressure. We see in this drawing another nerve that is uh, important that we note. This nerve is the ilioinguinal nerve. Ilioinguinal nerve provides sensation to the medial portion of the thigh. <clears throat> so it is a superficial nerve and it travels through the inguinal canal without traveling through the deep uh, inguinal ring. It only travels through the superficial inguinal ring. So it pierces transversalis fascia uh, more laterally and superiorly as it exits the spinal cord. <clears throat> so it travels also outside of the spermatic cord. It's not inside the spermatic cord like the genitofemoral nerve was. So make note of those distinctions, please. Here we have an internal view of this region, a Hesselbox triangle, and the deep inguinal uh, ring. So here uh, we're looking at the anterior abdominal wall. We can see rectus abdominis muscle going through the arcuate line. So we are here below inferior to the arcuate line. Uh, and so we've removed all of the back half, all of the visceral organs and the spinal cord and the back and everything and, and uh, removed it so we can see the inside of the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, so the emphasis here is uh, seeing the deep inguinal ring and the structures that are passing through that inguinal ring. Uh, we can also see the location of Hesselbach's triangle just medial to the deep inguinal ring, which makes sense because it's behind the superficial inguinal ring, which is more medial and more anterior. <clears throat> so uh, again, uh, looking at the contents of the spermatic cord and noting the distinction that that ilioinguinal nerve is not located inside the spermatic cord, it's located inside the inguinal canal, but not within the male spermatic cord. So here we have the female inguinal canal, uh, much more simple because females don't have uh, testicles outside their body. They have ovaries inside the abdominal cavity. So those ovaries during development did not get pulled down by the gubernaculum uh, ovarium into a scrotum. So the mons pubis uh, of the female is very similar to uh, the, the scrotal sac of the male. It's just that these contents didn't get pulled down into that region. So females still have an inguinal canal. They still have a superficial and a deep inguinal ring within that inguinal canal in the female uh, instead of the ductus deferens, we, and instead of a gubernaculum or, or uh, residual uh, developmental structures like the gubernaculum, we have the round ligament of the uterus. So this round ligament of the uterus anchors in the mons pubis, travels around deep in the pelvis to anchor to the uterus. It's actually interesting, uh, uh, women uh, who have uh, carried a child uh, ex experience or might know the experience of the child moving or kicking in the womb causes a tugging against the mons pubis that the woman feels anteriorly in the pelvis. Uh, so that's because this round ligament is attached to the uterus. Uh, here you can still see the ilioinguinal nerve traveling uh, within the canal 
as well as arteries and veins of the round ligament. So many of the same, anal same or analogous structures are located in the inguinal canal of the female. They just don't, they're not as well developed. They don't have as uh, large a purpose as in the male to uh, uh, supply and regulate the testicles. <clears throat> so here we have basically the, the dermatomes of all the individual named nerves and where they're supplying. So here I'm emphasizing the role of the uh, ilioinguinal nerve and the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve. Uh, and in fact, I talked about the reflex in the male of the cremaster muscle um, being contracted to protect the testicle. Uh, the reflex is actually initiated by uh, branches of the ilioinguinal nerve on the medial portion of the thigh. So for instance, um, uh, men you can try out this reflex if you're so inclined is to stimulate the medial compartment of the thigh uh, and causes reflex. So this reflex naturally occurs, for instance, when you're running or walking to draw the testicles up so they don't get damaged, um, or in cases of, um, uh, you know, any, anything brushing this area of the thigh in the male to cause the testicles to retract to some, to some small degree because the cremaster muscle. <clears throat> So another interesting consequence of this process in the male is the formation of this tunica vaginalis cavity. Uh, so this is a potential space, a, a potential sac, in which fluid can build up. So during development, this uh, processus vaginalis, or um, uh, uh, processus vaginalis here, is usually closed off, degenerates and gets closed and uh, is obliterated during development, but in some cases that doesn't happen and leaves a patent process from the peritoneum down into the tunica vaginalis. When that happens, fluid can uh, move from the peritoneal cavity through the spermatic cord into the tunica vaginalis, causing a buildup in fluid uh, in this region called a hydrocele. Another source of hydrocele common in athletes is bruising. Uh, within the uh, uh, scrotal region causing a buildup of fluid or edema that collects in the tunica vaginalis. So this can be uh, corrected using a needle to excise that fluid. Uh, surgical procedures can also uh, take place to remove tunica vaginalis to correct for the hydrocele condition. Uh, but this is something, especially if you go into uh, sports medicine uh, or, or, or uh, orthopedic type specializations where you'll encounter this in athletes. <clears throat> so now let's talk about herniations uh, related to the inguinal canal. There are herniations that can occur throughout the body due to uh, increased abdominal pressure, but most common ones are located uh, in the inguinal canal because this is already an open process. So there are different types of inguinal hernias. Uh, the first of these that I'm showing you is indirect. Indirect uh, because it travels indirectly uh, through the fascia, uh, indirectly within the spermatic cord. So it doesn't actually pierce any fascias. Uh, it just is a, a abdominal contents that have traveled with the spermatic cord, with the testicles, usually during development, uh, to enter the spermatic cord. So this is actually uh, visualizing a portion of the intestines uh, located within the spermatic cord. A direct inguinal hernia is usually the result of increased abdominal pressure. So in a direct inguinal hernia, the abdominal contents have directly pierced the transversalis fascia. Uh, and so usually this occurs in the weakening known as Hesselbach's triangle. Uh, so the direct inguinal hernia does not travel through the deep inguinal, uh, the deep inguinal ring. It only travels through the superficial inguinal ring. Uh, so again, portions of the abdominal cavity, uh, and this is usually from increased abdominal pressure, uh, you know, weightlifting or what, whatever the case may be. 
<clears throat> and another condition is the femoral hernia. Uh, so below the inguinal canal is the femoral triangle where the femoral artery and vein are located. So this herniation results in uh, a piercing through the fascia by increased abdominal pressure, but it's occurring outside of the inguinal canal. This kind of herniation does not travel through either the deep or superficial inguinal rings, as you can see here. This is due, to, this is acquired uh, due to increased abdominal pressure, and this kind, for whatever reason, is more prevalent in females than in males. Uh, so the male, you'll see the direct inguinal herniation more often than you'll see the femoral herniation. And that's it for lecture 8-1. I hope you enjoyed.